Mr. Mark Durkin. Mr. Durkin. Uh, question number one. Mr. Deputy Speaker. Minister. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Just moving in there. Yes. Um, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, thank you. Fujitsu has been a significant employer in Northern Ireland for over 35 years. Given the company's strategic importance, the executive, my department, and Invest NI have always maintained a close relationship with both local and parent company management at the highest levels. Invest NI liaises and works with the company on a regular basis, both at an operational level as well as at a higher strategic level, to help ensure that Northern Ireland plays the fullest part in the delivery of Fujitsu's worldwide corporate strategy. Following the announcement on Tuesday, the 11th of October, uh, that Fujitsu would be undertaking a major review of its, uh, of its European, Middle East, India and African operations, I spoke directly with Mr Duncan Tate, Group Director and Corporate Executive Officer of Fujitsu Japan, uh, also Fujitsu's Senior Executive Vice President and Head of Europe, Middle East, India, Africa and the Americas region, to reinforce Northern Ireland's long-established relationship with Fujitsu. I also emphasised the continuing contribution and excellence of the Northern Ireland workforce, as well as the competitive opportunities that investing in Northern Ireland continues to present to Fujitsu as it shapes its business for the future. Fujitsu is seeking to determine how best to re-equip its business to enable it to best compete in the digital economy. This process will be both complex and challenging. It will likely affect several thousand individuals across all of Fujitsu's European, Middle Eastern, Indian and African operations, including all of the company sites within the United Kingdom. The review will also take several months to complete. While recognising that Fujitsu's Northern Ireland operations will not be exempt from this overall review, I have tasked officials from Invest and I to continue to maintain regular communication with the company. I and my executive colleagues will continue to engage with Fujitsu management at the very highest levels to seek to ensure the best possible outcome for Northern Ireland. Thank you. Mr. Jurgen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I thank uh, the member or the Minister for his answer and his action uh, thus far uh, with regard to the job threats at Fujitsu. Uh, he has outlined to us the, the conversation he had with a senior representative from uh, Fujitsu. Did he? Uh, during that conversation, uh, reiterate or seek from uh, that member of staff any, I suppose, comment regarding the quality and dedication of the Fujitsu workforce here. Minister, uh, I thank the, the member for, for, for his question. Uh, and the member will be uh, familiar from a constituency basis uh, of Fujitsu's operations here in Northern Ireland. There's about 250 uh, people working at Timber Quay in, in London. I think it's actually. The, the company's biggest individual site within Northern Ireland uh, and a, a significant employer in the North West. Uh, and, and the member uh, mentions the, the high skills uh, level of the workforce there and right across Fujitsu's Northern Ireland operations. Uh, and given that this is uh, the review that the company announced uh, earlier in the month is ostensibly about ensuring that it, is, it has the skills as a business to be equipped for the future challenges that the digital economy presents. Then clearly the, the, the emphasis of my interventions, my conversations will always be around the highly skilled workforce that Fujitsu has here in Northern Ireland. And obviously the company, uh, no, nobody knows that better than the company itself. So whenever you're discussing skills and having a conversation around the skills of the workforce here, the company understand and appreciate it. And I think the, the role of me as minister is to, to, to underscore that and also offer some assurance for the future. Uh, and there are opportunities within this announcement as well uh, as the company looks to redistribute some employment from around the uh, Europe, Middle East, uh, India and Africa region. Uh, there may be opportunities for Northern Ireland, and I think with the highly skilled workforce that we have here in Northern Ireland, in Fujitsu, and the, the skills pipeline that we have, a strong skills pipeline that we have, there could well be opportunities for Northern Ireland to seize, even though this at the first glance looked like uh, bad news. Uh, or Mr. Steve Aiken. Uh, may I thank the Minister for his, question, uh, his answer so far. Uh, Fujitsu has talked about, and I just mentioned, their possible opportunity as well as challenge in its MENA and UK operations. Will the Minister seek, along with InvestNI, to work closely with Fujitsu to grow specific sectors here in Northern Ireland, and I'm particularly thinking around the fintech and also the cyber security areas, which areas that we've got particular strength and resonance in? Thank, thank the, the member for his question. I think another area that I would add to that list is around agri-tech, and it's an area which the uh, Fujitsu business, I know, has been looking to, to, to get into more, uh, and an area which, uh, again, Northern Ireland would, would have a standout reputation in. So, uh, I, 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 this was, these sorts of announcements um, are not good. You would rather not have them. Uh, 
Um, but I think that what we need to do is to do two things, and that's what I sought to do in the immediate aftermath of the announcement. One is to emphasise to the company at the highest possible level, and that's what I have already done, um, that Northern Ireland is a good place for them to do business, as I said to Mr Durkin, particularly because of the skills mix that we have and the strong skills that they have within their current workforce, but also that as they look to adjust their business, as they look to try to strengthen their business with an eye to the, 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 the future, uh, that Northern Ireland also presents opportunities for them. And the member mentions fintech and cybersecurity, and I've mentioned agritech. I, I think there are areas, strong sectors and emerging sectors within our economy uh, where we should be concentrating and focusing uh, not all of our efforts, but most of our efforts in ensuring that those strong and emerging sectors are what takes our economy forward into the future. I call uh, Gary Middleton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his answer so far? Uh, given the Minister's uh, outlined the fact that uh, we have a long-standing relationship with Fujitsu, uh, can the Minister uh, assure this House, or can he give any information on whether this would stand us in good stead with the company as they go through this evaluation process? Yes, Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I, I, I hope so. And, um, Northern Ireland has a, has a reputation, and certainly its, its workers have a, a reputation of being very loyal to companies, whether they are Indigenous companies or, or inward investors. And uh, I know that companies have to take decisions in the light of the, the challenges that they face, but I do hope uh, that that long-standing relationship that goes back some, I think, 35 years that uh, Fujitsu have had some sort of presence here in Northern Ireland, that it does uh, stand us in good stead, as, as the member mentions. Uh, we do have a good long-standing relationships as, a, as an executive with the company I have met in a previous role, and I know that the, the First and Deputy First Minister have also met uh, the Chairman of Fujitsu and keeping regular contract, contact with local, local management within the company. There is a long-standing relationship with the public sector uh, here in Northern Ireland. Uh, members may be familiar that, uh, with the fact that Fujitsu runs our uh, civil service HR Connect shared service. Uh, they also do some work on managed services for libraries and I, and also I think do some work for uh, I've recently secured some work for the Education Authority, but um, at the risk of repeating myself, I think the best aspect of that relationship, that long-standing relationship, the productive relationship that we have had, is the help and support that we have given to Fujitsu to help them to grow their business and to plant their business here in Northern Ireland through Invest NI or through our universities or, or through our colleges. And as, as I've mentioned before, as the company considers its, its future direction, that long-standing relationship, that good knowledge that they have about what Northern Ireland can offer their business, I hope that that does stand us in good stead and, and I hope that it is something uh, that will be valued by the company moving forward. Thank you. Uh, Mr Alex Maskey. Well, could I uh, thank the Minister also for his responses so far and, and extend the question to uh, could I ask the Minister what is himself and the Department doing to support the local uh, small and medium uh, manufacturing sector? The, 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 uh, the manufacturing sector, obviously, the, the, what, what Fujitsu do here in Northern Ireland is not, not manufacturing, it's, it's more around contract services, managed services, digital services, but clearly the manufacturing sector in Northern Ireland remains, uh, in spite of what um, some commentators would, would have us believe still remains a, 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 an integral and strong part of our economy. It is a, a sector which has faced challenges in the, uh, in the last number of days and in the last number of months and years, but it is, it is a, a sector which is, some would wish to characterise it, I think, unfortunately, as a sort of a sunset sector. I don't see it as that at all. In fact, quite, quite the opposite. It is a, a sector where, in spite of, of some notable set, setbacks in recent times, employment has grown in the sector, so there was a 4.1 per cent growth in uh, employment within the manufacturing sector, as evidenced by the uh, recent publication of the annual business uh, register and employment survey, 4.1 per cent of it. And interestingly, the, um, the, the, area, the council area with the, the biggest uh, manufacturing uh, sector is in Mid-Ulster. So, you know, sometimes there's a, a, a feeling that it, this is all very Belfast-centric, and it's, it's not the case when it comes to, to manufacturing. Um, in terms of support that has been given since 2011, uh, Invest and I have been giving significant volumes of support to our manufacturing sector. Uh, they've given some £270 million to uh, manufacturing companies. That has then unlocked, Mr Deputy Speaker, nearly £2 billion worth of investment by those companies, and it has secured or, or created some 13,000 uh, jobs right across Northern Ireland. So, you know, it is a sector that is still integral and very important to our economy, and is one that we will continue to support in the fashion that we have over the last five years. Thank you. I call Chris Little. 
Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Can I welcome the assurances that the Minister has given in terms of representing and protecting the interests of hardworking, highly skilled, highly productive Fujitsu employees here in Northern Ireland and seek his assurances that he will also do all he can to encourage Fujitsu to ensure clear communications and consultation with the employees throughout this evaluation period? I have spoken with, uh, as I mentioned before, local management and then uh, corporate management uh, within the company. And, uh, you know, I think that they, obviously they, like any business, and particularly in the sector that they are in, which is an incredibly fast-moving sector, uh, faces, faces a huge number of, of challenges. Uh, and, but I, I think that they understand. Certainly I know that the local management does, and I know that the senior management in Japan also appreciates the, the work that has been done in Northern Ireland. I think the fact that they have grown from such a small base in Northern Ireland to the situation where they've got 800 uh, employees across a range of different sites, uh, some in the members' constituency, uh, is testimony to the skills of the workers here, because they wouldn't be investing here and they wouldn't have grown here if it hadn't been for the, the benefits that em employing people from Northern Ireland brings to their business. And, and, and I, I am sure, like any uh, good employer, they will ensure that their, their workers are kept abreast of, of developments in, in what is a, uh, an uncertain time for those workers. Thank you. We move on. Um, Mr. Christopher Stolford. Question number two, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Minister. Higher education institutions in Northern Ireland are autonomous and are responsible for increasing their international activity. Within this overall context, my department's higher education strategy, Graduating to Success, committed to ensure that the institutions reviewed their international strategies and set challenging targets to enhance their international standing. Each institution now has an international strategy in place to increase collaboration and the inward and outward mobility of, of students and staff. My department, together with counterparts in other devolved administrations, provides funding to Universities UK International, which supports the universities in their international efforts. In terms of attracting international students, the universities can participate in international visits coordinated by U Universities UK International and can access relevant networks and research. Education, including higher education, has significant export potential, and InvestNI now has a manager working with the education sector as a whole to increase international activity. SNI is working with our local universities to explore ways in which it can assist them to increase the number of international students enrolled. Universities have participated on trade missions, utilising the in-market teams and consultants to research and set up meeting programmes with potential partner universities or student recruitment agents. In addition to trade missions, universities also have access to InvestNI support and funding uh, is available to them to assist with flights and accommodation to visit potential new markets. Sir Deputy Speaker, in their international outreach effort, the universities can also avail of the support offered by the Northern Ireland bureaus in Washington and in Beijing. Uh, Mr. Stolfer. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I'm grateful to the Minister for the reply that he has given. Uh, what potential uh, does the Minister feel that education has as a potential export industry for Northern Ireland? We've seen uh, already, in the, I suppose, on the borders of my constituency, developments such as John Bell House which are designed to attract, I think, international students. Would the minister care to comment on initiatives such as that and what potential targets he feels should be set in that regard? Minister. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I thank, I thank the member for his question. I, 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 think it, I think our broad education sector, and obviously universities are, are a key part of that, uh, has huge, have huge potential uh, as an exporting uh, sector. Uh, and they do so in several ways. I, I actually should say that you know, I don't think we, we don't automatically think of education as an export sector compared to uh, health and life sciences or agri-foods or other parts of the manufacturing sector, but I do believe it is. And I believe it is in, in several ways, um, not least because of the quality and the high standard of our education system here in Northern Ireland. So in terms of attracting students, as I mentioned in my initial response, and, and also attracting academic talent, you know, I think where you have a university system where over 70 per cent of university research activity is, is rated as internationally excellent or, or world leading is something that helps to attract students here and also attract other academics. And the fact that we have 70, uh, 71 per cent of graduates in Northern Ireland achieve a first or a 2-1 again is something that sends a good signal out to, to potential students. I, I think we also have high quality of education and training uh, here in Northern Ireland which can be sold, for want of a better word, outside of Northern Ireland. I had an um, opportunity while I was in the Middle East recently to visit Dubai Healthcare City, which is a, a partnership between, or has a partnership between Queen's and uh, the Dubai government. And it's a fantastic opportunity for 
us to take our expertise there and work in partnership uh, with the government in, in the United Arab Emirates. And I think there's huge potential for universities. And I know that Ulster University are also engaged in similar um, uh, um, aspects as well. And another area where I think there is potential is around our boarding schools. We have, we have some very high quality boarding schools in Northern Ireland which are competitively positioned against their, their competition, say, in, in Great Britain. So I think there are several ways, including those and others, where I think it can become with a bit of nurturing, with a bit of help and a bit of support, a really important export industry for Northern Ireland. Thank you. I call Claire Hanna. Thank the Minister for his answers. Um, can the Minister outline uh, what mitigation plans his department has in place to address the potential shortfall in, fall in funding if we lose the Horizon 2020 fund and the fact that uh, it may be a less attractive destination to students who wouldn't be able to get uh, visas potentially with the uncertainty around Brexit and if that shortfall and that burden might be placed on students? Minister. Clearly, it is an area or it's an aspect of the ongoing negotiations that, that will see the UK exiting uh, the European Union, which obviously we, will, we as a department will have an interest in and will feed into uh, the overall negotiations that are going on to help ensure that Northern Ireland gets the best possible outcome. And there are a significant number of, I mean, actually, the, interestingly, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the, the number of international, so non EU students uh, now outweighs just slightly the, the number of EU students. That wouldn't have been the case a number of years ago. Um, so I think the universities are rightly looking beyond. Uh, not just their, their own neighbourhood, but also Europe and onto the wider world. Um, in terms of the, the funding position, obviously the funding has been assisted by uh, announcements made recently by the Chancellor in terms of securing funding right up until uh, and beyond leaving the European Union in respect of Horizon 2020. Uh, and, and, you know, it will be another issue that will be sorted out in negotiations. I would point out to, to, to the members, I think I have to the House before, that Horizon 2020 is a, a funding programme which is available to many states that are outside of the Union, European Union. I think there's around about 12 states. Um, and I think that the, the, um, the state that benefited most on a per capita basis from FP7, which was the predecessor of Horizon 2020, was Israel. Uh, so there are clearly opportunities for uh, states that are not in the EU to benefit from such funding arrangements, as well as whatever the, uh, Her Majesty's Government puts in place to uh, replace uh, Horizon 20, or uh, perhaps may put in place in additionality to Horizon 2020. Thank you. I call Kiva Archibald. Um, earlier, I'd like to thank the Minister for his responses so far. And uh, Earlier this afternoon, I met a delegation from NUS USI, um, and part of the discussion was obviously on fees. So could I ask the Minister when he'll bring forward his proposals for future funding of further and higher education? Minister. Mr. Deputy Speaker, it's a, the long-term sustainability of the university sector in Northern Ireland is something that is incredibly important uh, to get right. Uh, I've had discussions uh, with both Queen's University and with uh, the Ulster University in respect of this, and both have put, obviously put forward their own proposals for um, making the sector financially sustainable in the longer term. And uh, that's absolutely right that they should contribute to the debate in that way. It is, after all, about you know, they wanting to remain world class, they are wanting to remain world leading universities, and, and of course an important element of that is ensuring that they are financially sustainable. Uh, so I have had conversations with them, I will have conversations with uh, executive colleagues as well as around this, and, and the member will appreciate that this is, a, this is an issue which will require wider support, no matter what my views are, no matter what my party's views are, uh, this is an issue that will require wider support, but it is something, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that we do need to consider carefully uh, and take a decision on in the not too distant future. Thank you. Uh, next question, Mr. Mervyn Story. Question number three. Minister. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I'm, I'm very aware of the importance of exporting for our economy and the need to encourage more local businesses to sell outside of Northern Ireland. To help maximise our export potential, I launched the Trade Accelerator Plan in September, which is still being delivered by Invest Northern Ireland. This initiative builds on the wide range of support and advice already available to first-time and experienced exporters and provides enhanced support and financial assistance to target and enter an export market. Enhanced support includes a Great Britain market introduction programme initially for the construction sector and a Great Britain and Republic of Ireland retail market development programme for the food and drink sector. The Trade Accelerator Plan also provides for additional market visits, more inward buyer visits and enhanced support to companies from Invest NI's trade advisors based in international markets across the globe. First-time exporters can also avail of support toward their travel and accommodation costs when targeting the Great Britain market and toward accommodation costs for companies seeking to enter the Republic of Ireland market. 
In addition, through Invest NI's existing programmes, companies seeking to enter an export market for the first time can participate on its long-established export skills workshop series, as well as tailored programmes such as Going Dutch and Check It Out. They can receive assistance toward market research carried out in the market by experienced trade advisors, and there is also assistance with language translation and legal costs. So, Deputy Speaker, I would encourage all existing and potential exporters to work with Invest NI to expand their export operations or to take that first important step into exporting. Thank you, Mr. Story. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. Given the fact that uh, Northern Ireland was the only UK region uh, out to actually increase its exports last year, and given the information that the Minister has given to us today in relation to the help and assistance that is there for companies to access new markets, does he envisage that growth to continue? And uh, obviously, he has launched the accelerator plan. Does he uh, will he ensure that that is given the widest possible exposure to those companies that could take uptake in relation to that particular programme? Minister, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, yeah, I. I I concur with the member around the. It was very, very good to see that Northern Ireland was the. Um, we were the only region in the UK. It was good to see that we increased um, by a substantial amount, 9.5 percent of an increase in our manufacturing exports over the last year. Um, that was something that was. Um, you know, I think it is, it is worth putting on record that it is, it is nothing that, you know, that we as an executive do. It's, we provide support, but it's obviously up to the companies themselves with the high-quality products that they have. We will give them all the support and all the assistance and open doors for them, and I think that's our job. Um, but it is the, the standout performance of particularly the likes of our life and health sciences sector, which increased its sales by over 50 per cent, uh, external sales or export sales in the last year by over 50 per cent. Um, I would be being very brave and courageous if I was to say, look, I think this will absolutely continue. Uh, but there is already, and the member will be, I'm sure, aware from his own constituency already, anecdotal evidence amongst many exporters, not, not, notwithstanding the issues that uh, some importers will be facing, but as a result of the current currency fluctuations, many exporting businesses are already reporting uh, an increase, and that, that would be recorded after uh, those 9.5 per cent increase figures were, were published. The Trade Accelerator Plan is also showing some, some early su success. Deputy Speaker, we've had seven companies participating in the uh, GB Market Introduction Programme, and they're going to be meeting with potential customers at the end of, of, of October. All of those are new to the GB market, which is exactly what the intention of the plan was. Uh, and there are also been nine new applications for our, our exhibition and trade show support, which is called Solex, and also four new applications for, for Great Britain market visits. And that's something that we've started again, where companies who want to dip their toe into the water for exporting but are not sure about the market can go in and visit that market with some support from Invest and I. So the signs are good. You know, obviously, it still requires a lot of effort uh, on behalf of the companies themselves, but that will be, and I will ensure that that is supported at every opportunity by Invest and I. Thank you. Uh, I call Mr. Smith, Philip Smith. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. Uh, has the Minister been able to identify any additional export opportunities during his, his discussions with Liam Fox? And would he seek to improve cooperation between Invest NI and UKTI, particularly in the aerospace and defence sectors? Minister. There are, I had a very, very good uh, discussion back in the summer with, with Liam Fox, uh, and it's something that we have been following up uh, with his new department at an official level. And I hope to, to, to be able to meet with uh, Dr. Fox again before, before the year is out. Uh, and, and he has had a, a fresh and interesting approach to this whole subject. Obviously, he has been charged to go out and to um, almost immediately on, on the UK exit from the European Union to sell uh, the UK as a whole to, to the world and open up new markets and, and try to focus on uh, instead of focusing. Um, almost exclusively, as has been encouraged over the last number of years, on a European market which has been struggling, uh, looking at some of those emerging markets around the world where there is much greater growth uh, and therefore much greater potential for, uh, for the UK and for Northern Ireland. The member mentions uh, the aerospace sector, uh, and it is an area, notwithstanding the uh, troubling and worrying news in Bombardier at the tail end of last week, it is a sector which uh, the executive has sought to support uh, through a dedicated strategy, uh, and that strategy uh, was published in 2014 with a target to increase, expend or increase revenues from that sector from $1 billion to $2 billion, and we're making good progress on that. Um, I think the revenues are now up to about £1.3 billion uh, annually from the sector. So it is a sector that obviously is, is one that we are focused on with the, not just Bombardier, but also the sort of 60-odd companies that there are operating in the aerospace defence uh, security and space sectors, uh, and is an area where I think there are opportunities, and is one that is recognised at a UK level as well. And I would imagine that, um, as as 
the uh, UKTI or the Department of International Trade starts to look at trade missions and visits around the world, I'm sure you will see Northern Ireland companies availing of those opportunities. And that's something that I want to encourage as well. Not, not just that Northern Ireland companies are going on invest in I led trade missions, but that we're also participating as fully as we possibly can on UK wide trade missions as well. Thank you. I call Mr. McGuigan, Philip McGuigan. Uh, last can call you. Uh, just given the uncertainty on international investment at the minute following uh, the EU referendum result, can I ask the Minister if he has considered uh, increasing support to local government to allow them to increase support to business start-ups? Mr. Mr. Um, Mr. The regional start initiative, which is the, the programme for uh, startups and growing businesses, new businesses, is being uh, ha has been devolved to. I'm trying to get the right. It has already been devolved to local government. It has been carried out on their behalf collectively uh, by Invest Northern Ireland, and I think that is due to change before this year is out. Um, so. Councils have what they have been asking for for a number of years, which is some autonomy and some flexibility to deliver programmes which are tailored to the particular needs of, the, of their areas. And obviously, a lot of different ways. There's a lot of uniformity across Northern Ireland. There are particular parts of Northern Ireland. I mentioned Middle Sur earlier and the concentration of manufacturing and engineering businesses within that area. Uh, that will give the, the flexibility and the autonomy that the councils have will allow them to tailor uh, the programmes and support uh, additional tailor additional programmes and support. To the needs of their area, but of course we will continue to work with businesses through Invest NI um, directly, but also through councils. It's incredibly important as councils develop their own development plans for their areas. Many, some are already out there already, some are still in, in the works. Um, that Invest NI are plugged into that and are working with councils to uh, not just ensure that uh, we maximise the, the amount of startups that there are, but also that those businesses who are established are looking at export and external opportunities. We move on. I call Carla Lockhart. Question five. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The Assured Skills Programme is continuing to deliver for Northern Ireland. Alongside support provided by Invest Northern Ireland, I believe that Assured Skills support con continues to be instrumental in securing new jobs for Northern Ireland, such as the 94 uh, support engineering jobs and, and research and development jobs recently announced by Metaswitch. The Assured Skills offer has many benefits for companies. They can find employees in what is commonly a new labour market. Any training developed is bespoke, helping to find people with the right skills and attributes for their company. Trainees are also more productive more quickly, with a consequent uh, positive effect on the company's bottom line. Furthermore, networks are established with local further education colleges and universities, with the potential for ongoing links for mutual benefit. To date, there have been 22 company projects through Assured Skills, and when fully realised, uh, all, uh, there will be some 5,704 jobs created. Uh, this will benefit the local economy by £144 million each year. In addition, Assured Skills supports short-term interventions to meet identified needs of existing employers in Northern Ireland and also to help unemployed graduates find suitable employment. The Software Testers Academy has been the most successful intervention to date. However, we also use our academy model to meet needs in areas such as cloud computing, data analytics, financial services, 2D animation, and computer numerical control machining. This has benefited companies such as Highwire Press, Deloitte, PwC, EY, Alexander Mann, Fintru, Magellan, and White Hat Solutions, to name but a few. Assured Skills is a, an innovative and responsive program that has made a big um, impact in a short period of time. However, the programme is continuing to evolve, and it is my intention, Mr. Deputy Speaker, to keep Assured Skills at the leading edge of economic interventions. Thank you, and can I thank the Minister for his compre comprehensive uh, answer. Skills is obviously an area that I'm very interested in, and I think of my own constituency of Upper Ban and the, the industries that we have. Uh, can the Minister uh, outline what consideration he is giving uh, within Northern Ireland to future skills needs, particularly within agri-food uh, and life science? I agree with you. The member skills is an incredibly important uh, part, and sometimes actually a differentiating part of Northern Ireland's uh, proposition to, uh, particularly to, to inward investors. And some, sometimes it is, as I, I mentioned, one investment in, in my first answer, which it, it was a differentiator. It was, it was a difference maker. It was what, what land, landed this investment in Northern Ireland rather than in somewhere else. Um, we have, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, our, our skills barometer in place, and we have the, the work of the matrix panel, um, which has identified growth sectors within our economy and where skills need are, particularly where there are skills needs uh, that will evolve whenever corporation taxes is uh, 
reduced, uh, and that will uh, hopefully bring growth in, in, in existing, but also in some different sectors within our, our economy. So there's a strong evidence base which we're, we're following. Uh, we have then put in place a future skills program, uh, which uh, will come into place, is in place or uh, coming into place, which will, um, in the first instance, uh, Deputy Speaker, uh, have 240 people going through six colleges, so right across Northern Ireland, not uh, not limited to say the Greater Belfast area, and they would be specifically in data analytics and cyber security in the first instance, which are both existing strong sectors, but sectors where there is huge potential moving forward as well. Uh, we will consider other sectors, and other sectors are being considered, including life and health sciences, which is a, a huge part of the members' own local upper band constituency. Um, skills are, are, as I say, central to our, our attractiveness as a region to, to invest in, and I think the assured skills program uh, and the future skills program that we're developing uh, will be key to uh, achieving success in the future. Thank you. That ends the period for listed questions. We now move on to topical questions and I call Mrs Jenny Palmer. Mrs Palmer. Thank you Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, would the Minister outline what discussions he has had with the Northern Ireland industry on the economic impact of the long-term delay to the York Street interchange? Minister. I, the, so the, the York Street interchange, I, um, I haven't, um, it's, it's an issue that has come up in discussions. I have met with um, CBI, for example, and the Chamber. It certainly came up in discussions with the, the CBI. It was one of the infrastructure programs, Mr Deputy Speaker, that they emphasised of being of, uh, of importance to the economy moving forward. I think it came up in conversations with the Chamber. If it didn't, I'm sure that it will in future conversations, as I'm sure it will with other organisations and indeed individual businesses as I uh, move around the country and meet with uh, businesses and organisations on a regular basis. Mrs Palmer. Thank you for the uh, response, Minister. In view of the significant economic impact that has been highlighted by all stakeholders, including many manufacturing and logistics companies in my own constituency, will the Minister seek to engage with the Minister of Finance to look at alternative funding mechanisms directly with the Chancellor, thereby bypassing the extremely short-sighted perspective of the Infrastructure Minister? Minister. One, one thing. The member will know that I, I served as, as, as finance minister for a time, and uh, one of the things that I, I learned, um, in particularly in terms of, of capital investment, is that there are always many, many, many more deserving capital projects than the capital budget will, will permit you to develop in any one particular budget year or even budget period. Um, look, I, I understand the, the particular circumstances that the infrastructure and minister finds himself in on this issue, and that the, he was hoping to avail of some European funding, but the call for that will become. Um, in and around the, the time in which the uh, UK will exit the European Union and therefore some uncertainty about future commitments around that. So I understand the issue that he finds himself in, but it isn't the same, Mr Deputy Speaker. And whilst I agree with the member that the York Street interchange is, a, is an incredibly important development, not just for that small part of North Belfast, but for the whole of, of Northern Ireland and the whole of Northern Ireland's economy, um, I think it is, it, is, um, it is wrong to sort of create the impression that there are no other infrastructure or major infrastructure projects going on. So obviously the A5 and the A6 are moving forward, both of, of importance to the economy, particularly those strong manufacturing businesses that are located uh, in the middle of Northern Ireland, uh, and also the transport hubs in Belfast and again in Londonderry, which are going forward. So there are major capital projects which I'm sure the Department for Infrastructure will be taking forward. In, in terms of alternative financing, I have always been open to idea. I mean, it is, is principally a, a matter for the Department for Infrastructure in conjunction with the Department of Finance to take forward. If there's anything I can do to, to help on that, of course, I'll not be found wanting in that regard. Um, I did, of course, uh, uh, serve as, as Sammy Wilson's apprentice for some time and uh, learned a lot from him. Um, forgot a lot. Yeah. Uh, some of which I've already forgotten. Um, but one thing I didn't forget was that he uh, he, uh, he did have, and he's repeated it recently, that uh, given that the Harbour Estate uh, will benefit uh, the very profitable and very successful Harbour Estate will benefit greatly from the work at York Street Interchange. It is perhaps time once again, Deputy Speaker, to look at the option of them making a significant contribution to the work at York Street. I remind the Minister of the, of the two-minute rule still applies, Mr. Chris Little. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Economy Minister why he has been so reluctant to tell the people of Northern Ireland how he voted in the EU referendum and whether his department has modelled what impact leaving the European single market would have on the economy of Northern Ireland? Minister. Mr. Mr. Deputy Speaker, there are, there are some who uh, would wish to go back over again and again and again the, the referendum campaign. Um, I, I have. Um, 
made it perfectly clear that my job, my focus now is, uh, irrespective of how people voted, is to focus on getting the best deal for Northern Ireland. Uh, and I would encourage the member and his party, and indeed all sides of the House, uh, to get the head down, get on with the work, and get the best deal for Northern Ireland. Mr. Little. I, I, I note that the Economy Minister again has failed to ask either of the two questions I attempted, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, with regards to the, the single uh, market. But I, I'll ask him in relation today. We've heard uh, how a planned £100 million investment fund has been downgraded and repackaged, however skillfully, by Finance Minister O'Muller to a £30 million first step stimulus package because the European Investment Bank no longer is willing to take an active role in this fund. Can I ask the Economy Minister why the European Investment Bank is no longer willing to take an active role, and is this in any way connected to the Brexit vote? Minister. Yeah, I, I think the member is a, is a cross It's not my job to answer for uh, the Finance Minister. I think he's perhaps at some cross, uh, cross purposes. I don't think the stimulus package has any relation to the uh, the investment fund, which of course I'm very, very familiar with having come up with the idea when I was in, in finance. Those are issues as that the member should be putting to the, uh, the Minister of Finance and seeking an answer from him. Uh, look, I, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry that, uh, for the member that uh, the predictions of, of, of doom and gloom that he and his party and others and uh, all sides of the House uh, have other sides of the House engaged in are not, are not coming to pass and that we haven't been, to borrow a phrase from um, uh, one member in the House now haven't been plunged into recession, um, and that the UK economy is doing well, and the Northern Ireland economy continues to do well, uh, and that everybody from all of the all of the great authorities—I uh, wouldn't categorise the member in that category, of course—but uh, all of the great authorities and in international banking and the IMF, the World Bank, all of their predictions of gloom and gloom haven't come to pass. Uh, and what we have to do, to re-emphasise, is to, to we have to make the best deal, get the best deal that we possibly can from this, and we need to get our heads down get on with the work which my department is engaged in and feeding into the Executive Office, who uh, First and Deputy First Minister are obviously engaging with the Prime Minister directly yesterday. Uh, and we must do our very, very, very best to get the best possible deal that we can for Northern Ireland. Thank you. I call Mr Robbie Butler. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, thank you, Minister, uh, for your answers so far. In view of the scandal around the renewable heat debacle, could the Minister outline the procedures that he has taken to prevent a similar occurrence? Mr. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I know that the member is, is, is new to the House and, and um, will be unfamiliar with the uh, convention that whenever issues are being examined and scrutinised by uh, the PAC and the Audit Office, that it, is, it would be inappropriate for ministers or indeed members to, to pass comment on it. Um, you know, I, 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 look, the, the, it is an issue which I take greatly seriously. Um, there are lessons to be learned from those, and we must learn lessons from the RHI issue. Uh, but what we also must do, and what I'm also focused on as well as learning those lessons, uh, is trying to deal with the issue and try to control the issue as best as we possibly can. Mr. Cutler. Thank you, uh, Minister, for your graciousness. Uh, I'm new to the House. Uh, it may only happen once or twice. Um, can the Minister assure us that with the rush to install wind energy before the rock expiry in uh, March of 2017, that he has personally ensured that all appropriate measures have been taken so that no one is receiving any subsidy for electricity that is not, not delivered to the grid by that date? Obviously, yes, the members are right. I mean, there was a closure that was brought to the Northern Ireland Renewable uh, Obligation, but there have been there are some grace periods in for certain circumstances, and obviously it's, in, it's imperative that the way in the department, the regulator, and others involved in that ensure that, as the member says, nobody is, is getting anything for you know, the, those timelines, those strict hard stops, in respect of all of that, are, are kept in place, and that nobody who should be benefiting uh, shouldn't be benefiting from it is benefiting from it. Thank you. I call Mr. Trevor Clark. Much, uh, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister on his view on the announcement today in relation to Heathrow Airport? Minister, Deputy Speaker, I, I warmly welcome the, de the decision by uh, Her Majesty's Government to support uh, extension at, at Heathrow. Um, obviously, you know, not, uh, it is a decision to favour the <coughs> option of a third runway at Heathrow that has been taken by, by the government. Um, it is one that obviously will be subject to various planning, environmental. Uh, impact assessments, but it is one that, that I welcome. Uh, I think the business community in Northern Ireland will welcome, and I think everybody in Northern Ireland should, should praise the government for their decision, uh, because our connectivity, is, as we know, 
uh, particularly as we know as a, a peripheral region within the United Kingdom is incredibly important. Um, we need to have more direct routes from Belfast. I'm glad that we are increasing the number of direct routes from Belfast. London and, and Heathrow uh, is in and of itself a key business route for Northern Ireland, uh, and, and Heathrow is, of course, a crucial hub airport as a gateway to the world. So I, I, I think that uh, I welcome, and I'm sure that the business community in Northern Ireland will also welcome the, uh, the long-awaited decision by uh, Her Majesty's Government to, to give the go-ahead to an extension, uh, um, or uh, sorry, a new runway at Heathrow. Mr. Clark. I thank you, Minister, for that answer. And as usual, fullness. He probably actually has asked my supplementary in relation to connectivity. But I'm sure that, uh, given the answer he's given me, I'm, I'm satisfied that he's answered my question in relation to connectivity in Northern Ireland. Just to re-emphasise, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the connectivity is is incredibly important. We we, we have had. Um, challenges in Northern Ireland to ensure that we do have good connectivity through direct flights, but I think sometimes there is a, a, an interest, a particular interest, Mr. Deputy Speaker, on ensuring that Belfast has direct connectivity. That's not always possible. That can always be challenging, but uh, through hub airports like Heathrow and like Amsterdam, which we have a, a direct route into as well, and Brussels, uh, that can be just as vital, just as important for inbound tourism and also for business and trade. Thank you. I call uh, Nelson McCousin. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, HMS Caroline is uh, a very important um, historic vessel um, docked in Belfast, and uh, particularly in this year of the centenary of the Battle of Jutland. Um, it has received five star uh, recognition as a tourist attraction. Uh, could I ask the Minister to comment on that, his assessment of that, and the significance of it? Minister. Deputy Speaker, I, I think yeah, I had the, the, the privilege of attending the, the official opening of the uh, uh, new HMS Caroline uh, attraction back in um, June time. Uh, I think it was a fantastic investment of around £10 million, pounds, which was supported by this executive. And I'm really, really pleased that it has been recently awarded by Tourism NI a uh, five star visitor attraction rating, which means that it is a, of an outstanding level. And I think if anybody in the House or outside who has visited HMS Caroline will agree that it is an outstanding uh, tourist attraction and something that will greatly benefit uh, the whole of Belfast and particularly that, that maritime area that we have in Titanic Quarter. Mr. McCausland. Yep. Uh, could I thank the uh, Minister for his answer and um, follow up by asking then um, if there are any plans uh, to make the facility there at HMS Caroline even more attractive for visitors, uh, potential there to improve the product, and in, also in terms of the connectivity that he mentioned with the wider maritime history of the area? Mr. Deputy Speaker, I have recently agreed a, a process. I mean, I think everybody agrees it's a great facility. It's not in the best of locations at this moment in time. It does need to be kept in that, in that area so that there can be connectivity to Titanic, Belfast, and the Nomadic as well. Uh, I've recently agreed a process which will allow the movement of the, the, the vessel from where it is currently located. It's a little further out uh, to beside the pump house, which will a much better, more accessible um, location for HMS Caroline will also allow for some onshore. Uh, visitor centre and other parts of the attraction to be added to it, which will enhance the, the, the attraction even further. Thank you. I call Joanne Bunting. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, the Minister will be aware of the worrying news uh, from my constituency in East Belfast regarding Bombardier. Mr Deputy Speaker, um, what discussions has the Minister had with Bombardier and the unions representing the workers? Minister. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I, I share the members' concerns about the, the news that has emanated from, from Bardier, Bombardier at the tail end of the week, uh, and I think that this is, this is on, on top of the, uh, the announcement back in February of this year. This is another blow to, to the, the workforce, the dedicated workforce uh, in Bombardier's Belfast and, and Northern Ireland operations. Um, as soon as the news broke, I was in contact with Michael Ryan, uh, who is the, the head of the Belfast operation in Bombardier, um, discussing the detail of it with him. Uh, and offering my full support to him and to the Northern Ireland operations and trying to make it clear that I will do all that I possibly can to, to fight to save as many jobs as we possibly can here in Northern Ireland. Um, there has been uh, some detail revealed around two-thirds of the 7,500 jobs will be going in the transportation sector of the business, which won't affect uh, Northern Ireland, and then some encouraging uh, comments within the Bombardier statement which said that they would ramp up uh, employment within the C-Series uh, and also the Global 7000 project, two key projects uh, in Belfast. So there are potential opportunities, a bit like Fujitsu, but some potential opportunities for Northern Ireland, even though this is very troubling uh, news. I've also um, met yesterday morning with Unite the Union um, to uh, discuss the issue in detail with them. And again, I, I stand alongside them uh, and will fight alongside them to preserve as many of the jobs as we possibly can here in Northern Ireland. 
um, because we all know that you know that the work that they do in Bombardier is in Belfast is of the highest quality. Uh, and whilst this company faces huge challenges now and, and moving forward, Deputy Speaker, I believe, I firmly believe that Bombardier in Northern Ireland uh, has a strong enough operation with a good, strong skills base that can help the company to get out of the difficulties that it's currently in. Quick supplementary, Joanne Bunting. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Speaker. Minister, in your earlier answer, you made mention of the dedicated strategy the executive has to double revenue from aerospace, defence, security and the space sector. In light of last week's announcement, and given East Belfast's strong history and skilled labour force in this area, might there be opportunities for redeployment or expansion of some of these other companies in East Belfast? Last minute. I, I, I think there are, Deputy Speaker, I think there are huge opportunities. In spite of the news on Bombardier last week, uh, I think there are huge opportunities still for our aerospace defence. Uh, security and space sector here in, in Northern Ireland. Um, I mentioned the C-Series, I mentioned the Global 7000 project. It's testimony to uh, the staff in, in Belfast and across Northern Ireland who work in Bombardier that they are involved in every major project that Bombardier has, uh, which is testimony to the strong skills levels that they have and the dedication of their work. I, I do think that there are opportunities. And, and, and Last week, um, before the Bombardier news, we, we launched a new space strategy for Northern Ireland. I, mean, I didn't, didn't think that I would ever be in a position in a job where I would announce a space strategy in Northern Ireland, um, but we are. It is an area where Tallaght, as we were located in the uh, members' constituency, and we had the uh, pleasure of visiting it with her recently over the summer, um, are doing some fantastic work and are real pioneers in the, the space sector. And I think there are huge opportunities with a new space propulsion integration centre that they've recently opened um, for us to create more jobs uh, and also to do a lot more research and development in that sector here in Northern Ireland. Thank you very much. Time is up.